Alrighty guys, hello and welcome back. We got a short video today. I start this off by saying I'm currently at a standstill on the Nomads project, uh, so hopefully I get myself unstuck. But currently I'm having trouble finding the data in the code for the Nomads Commander. Uh, and this is data that I, I want to get in order to get the video up to a standard where I feel comfortable releasing it. So if you guys are not code savvy, uh, skip to the time that I'm posting here on the screen. Uh, now for the meat of the video. But for those of you guys that stick around, if you are familiar with the Nomads code in any way, shape or form and the way it was put together, it, it was put together way differently than the other Forge Alliance Forever factions, as best as I can tell. Arguably better from a, a coding efficiency standpoint, but different and can spend maybe 10 minutes showing me where uh, the stuff I need to find is. I would really appreciate it. Like you'll have my undying love. I'm a novice dev at best with no experience in Lua, but after cloning the repo and spending about two hours searching, I'm having a lot of trouble finding the information that I'm needing specifically around uh, the way the capacitor upgrade works, as well as a couple of the other command uh, upgrades specifically to the back position. They seem to share a lot of methods and I'm having issues finding where the actual variable manipulation happens within the script so that I can a, understand the actual values that are being applied, and B, I think there might be some issue with it. So um, if you guys can help me out, I would really, really appreciate it. Um, like I said, probably only take 10 minutes if you know uh, if you know where what I'm looking for is, but I would really appreciate it. So today we're going to be looking at uh, an older science topic. Uh, this one was actually not discovered by me. Um, so. Huge shout out to Scooby for finding the topic and for Cheeseberry on the Forge Alliance Forever forums for doing the research on this, honestly. So Scooby brought it to my attention. Cheeseberry has already done a good amount of research and uh, I'll link the um, forum post in the description below if you guys are interested in watching any of his footage. He had a couple of video clips, didn't post it to YouTube or anything. Um, there were only 260-ish views though on the forum post and considering there are thousands of you that play the game and a good chunk of you guys watch my channel, I did want to publicize this a little bit more because I do think it's important. But regardless, I've linked his work down in the description below. Super important to me. I don't want to take credit for uh, any work that's already been done. I just want to bring it to y'all's attention. So today we're going to be talking about T1 point defense and walls. This is a super common template that you see all over the place. I use it, everyone uses it. It's a T1 point defense surrounded by eight walls. Now, if you are new to the game, first off, welcome to the greatest real-time strategy game of all time. Um, the reason players do this, because this might look a little bit weird if you're brand new to the game, especially if, well, actually, if you play Age of Empires 2, there's there's a similar tactic within Age of Empires 2 that prevents you from researching, that, makes it so that your towers can fire at the base without researching murder holes. But anyway, I digress wildly. Um, it allows, the purpose of it is to insulate the T1 point defense from direct fire from things like tanks, things like Mantis, etc. It can help a T1 point defense survive a lot longer. It unfortunately doesn't help against artillery or anything that has kind of an arcing shot. So mobile missile launchers, mobile artillery, static artillery, things like that not going to be super effective against that, but it is very helpful at the T1 phase against T1 main battle units. So looking at the setup from the ground level, we're gonna be comparing all four factions here. Uh, it would appear that the Seraphim is going to be in the best situation, looking just at the unit models. The walls are almost as high as the point defense itself. And the Cybran is going to be on the worst side with the UEF and the Aeon sitting somewhere in between because the Cybran, the point defense six, uh, sticks out kind of like a sore thumb over the actual walls. Um, our tests were conducted with Auroras, Strikers, and Thams sitting behind a shield to attack the point defense. So the point defense is just throwing into a shield. Reason being, I wanted to make sure that there was uniform damage across the board and the Seraphim shields do a really good job of absorbing a lot of damage. So, Contrary to our initial results, our, our initial kind of look at the models, the actual results in practice tell a very, very different story. The Aeon point defense is entirely impervious from any enemy fire until one of the wall sections is destroyed, which is incredibly impressive. 
a lot of times you will find that there will be certain amounts of damage that will make it over or through the walls due to the way that the hitboxes are set up. This is not the way, this is not the case in terms of the Eruptor as well as the walls surrounding it. So the Aeon, clear winner here. The UEF and Cybran come kind of tied for second with a little bit of a weird interaction. It appears that the wall section opposite of the enemy fire needs to be destroyed before the attacking units can focus on the point defense. Now this is again, weird interaction here. I'm not 100% sure what is going on. What might be happening is the shots are arcing and the hitbox is set up in such a way that it misses the hitbox by shooting below it and then hits the wall on the opposite side. That's kind of that's kind of my best my best theory here, but I'm not 100% sure. And then coming in last is the Seraphim. The walls seem to do literally nothing. By literally, I literally mean literally. The walls could just not even be there and you would still have the same effect. So, uh, that being said, if you're playing Seraphim, you probably don't need this template because it does literally nothing. By literally, again, I mean literally. So why does this happen? So it looks like the tanks target much higher on the Seraphim point defense uh, than the hitbox covers. So what I mean by this is, in order for this template to actually work, you have to have uh, the hitbox for the walls has to overlap with the hitbox for the point defense itself. And that has to create some sort of blocking for the units that are attacking. So whenever you set up a game and whenever you're coding a game, there, it's very rare that your hitbox is the entire model. A lot of times there will be a specific point on a unit that uh, an attacking unit will target and then it will register a hit if it hits that particular hit box. That's why we, that's why we call it a hit box. In this particular instance, it looks like the hit box for the Aeon, the Aeon walls overlaps with where the units are targeting on the Aeon PD in a perfect fashion. So there's, there's no uh, chance that any shots are going to be missing in that particular scenario. On the opposite side of the equation, on the Seraphim side, the hitbox is very low on the model. So it is actually in line with the uh, Aeon walls. The attacking units will target Seraphim and Aeon walls very similarly in a very similar spot on the model relative to the terrain itself. But the difference on the Seraphim side is the hitbox is placed very high on the actual Seraphim point defense itself which means that even though there is a model in the way that a tank is just going to shoot through that model and hit the point defense on the other side. So weird interaction there. And uh, goes to show you that, it goes to show you that there's a little bit more behind the scenes rather than just the size of the model in terms of how damage is actually registered within games. So I find this super interesting. I took a crack at making an RTS game a long time ago, like a couple years back and realized that it was a monumental undertaking and decided that my time could be better spent elsewhere. But this is one of the things that I struggled with a lot was the hitboxes on my units and how I would actually register and make those interact with each other. So um, from a balance perspective, I think this is in a pretty good spot, honestly, just because uh, the Aeon T1 units are designed to run away and have like a controlled retreat. So having a hard point to fall back on could be very, very helpful for them. Anyway, that's about it for today, guys. Uh, it was a shorter one today. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, once again, huge thanks to Cheeseberry for putting together the research on this one. And huge thanks to Scooby for bringing it to uh, my attention. And that's it for today, guys. I hope I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.